One of the most fascinating uh, parts of the biology of our planet are the phenomenon of coral reefs. Now, these ecosystems grow in shallow, sunlit waters of the planet uh, where they provide a three-dimensional structure which can actually be seen from outer space. But one of the most important aspects of that structure is it provides habitat for an estimated one million to nine million species, many of which are unknown to science. And uh, in addition to that, of course, the fisheries that are associated with coral reefs provide enormous amounts of protein for human populations that often live uh, in close vicinity. Now, to understand coral reefs, you need to understand that corals are not just a single organism. When you first look at a coral, it may have some little blues and pinks and so on, but the overall colour is brown. And that's due to the presence of tiny, single-celled, plant-like organisms called zooxanthellae and they are dinoflagellates that have learnt to live, and this is over millions of years of evolution, to live inside the gastric tissues of, of corals. Now corals are those simple anemone-like uh, multicellular organisms. Once they're together, this magic begins because you've got the plant living inside the coral, trapping sunlight and passing that on to the coral host, and at the same time the coral is providing a place for these algae to live and, and fertilizer essentially, inorganic nutrients that come from the catabolic processes within the coral as they break up uh, you know, different compounds and so on. So this symbiosis, a bit like a cactus in you know, water short environments, this is really designed for living in the low nutrient concentrations of coral reefs, which of course when you go to coral reefs you see water that's extremely clear and that really is also uh, an indication that there's not a lot of particles or in fact inorganic nutrients to promote the normal productivity you see elsewhere. Now one of the phenomena that is often seen on coral reefs is where isolated patches of corals uh, have turned from this brown colour to a very white colour and this is referred to as bleaching. Now this can happen on a single colony basis and is generally tracked down to the fact that the local conditions were stressful. And what happens is that that, uh, that symbiosis between uh, corals and zooxanthellae falls apart. And of course once you've just got the, the animal and no longer the photosynthetic organisms, the coral's chief um, source of energy has disappeared. And so this phenomenon of bleaching once it happens uh, often leads to the starvation or the failure of corals to compete effectively on the substrate or just simply the fact that they run out of food and die. And so bleaching after a stress can lead to mortality. Now on a colony to colony basis, uh, coral bleaching really isn't a problem. You can see it uh, in response to um, very low salinities, maybe after a storm or uh, you can see it when um, there's too much light and so on. So there's a run range of, of structures, even toxins like cyanide, when people go and fish uh, using cyanide to puff into the reef to, to trap fish, that can have a very negative influence and cause bleaching. So bleaching is a sign of stress in corals. But the reason it's significant today is that since the early 1980s, it's, be it's begun to occur on very broad scales. We're talking hundreds of kilometers of reef bleaching at one time. And this is referred to as mass coral bleaching. This is essentially that symbiosis breaking apart on a kilometre scale. Now the reason that has been also of significance is that that has been tracked to slightly warmer than normal temperatures. And just to give you an idea about the scale of those temperatures, essentially one or two degrees above the long-term summer maximum temperature is enough to destabilise the symbiosis that corals enjoy with zooxanthellae. So the effect of small amounts of warming on coral reefs uh, can lead to bleaching on a massive scale. And in some cases, if the temperatures are not too high for too long, coral reefs will actually get their zooxanthellae back and can recover. Now, when I say recover, they've recovered their symbionts. 
There's a number of studies that show that their ability to grow and reproduce uh, during that period in which they've been bleached and recovered is actually compromised. So it's probably got some costs. But the biggest costs come when you have mass coral bleaching on the scale of reefs. And if the temperatures are really high for quite long periods of time, for example, four weeks at sort of two degrees Celsius, you'll actually see mass mortality of corals. They won't get their symbionts back and they will die. And we saw this recently in the northern sector of the Great Barrier Reef where um, very warm temperatures sat uh, above coral reefs, some of the most pristine reefs uh, on the Great Barrier Reef, and drove a really big change uh, in the amount of coral. The estimates were as high as 35% of the corals of that region uh, were bleached and ended up dying. So when you start to see changes at that scale, you're starting to look about impacts on uh, tourism, on fishing that uh, you know, have species that depend on coral reefs for their three-dimensional habitat and so on. Now the relationship between temperature stress and corals bleaching and in fact dying in some cases is quite rock solid. It's rock solid to the point where satellites can measure the skin temperature of the ocean and when they detect an anomaly of a particular size, and this is really the size of the anomaly plus the exposure time, that amount of temperature stress can lead to very accurate predictions about what will happen to coral reefs in the intervening period. Uh, for example, um, as we went into the early part of this year, the northern Great Barrier Reef was seeing, you know, two to three degrees higher temperatures than what you'd normally see. And these lingered for long enough to cause really major impacts in terms of bleaching and the final mortality, which is as high as a third of those corals in that third of the Great Barrier Reef that was affected. Now, the relationship between temperature is also uh, able to give us some clues about what will happen in the future. Because we know today that there's a certain temperature above which you start to accumulate heat stress, and this is sort of one degree above the, the long-term summer maxima, that temperature stress translates into uh, these really big impacts. Now, that trigger, if you then compare it to um, models of sea temperature and how it will change over the coming years, indicate that we'll cross that threshold more and more frequently until probably about the middle of this century temperatures will every year be too warm for corals. That uh, and our understanding of what happens to coral reefs after they get impacted uh, by warmer than normal conditions is very serious because it predicts the loss of reef building corals uh, over most parts of the Great Barrier Reef. This is fed into of course the expanding literature on the impacts of climate change uh, where you've got not only coral reefs but you've got cloud forests, you've got you know, coastal savanna and so on, that are all showing massive changes in terms of, of uh, the impact of thermal stress in the future. So it's not only coral reefs that, that are predicted to disappear, but also kelp forests, cloud forests and so on. So we've got a really big picture now of what a world might be like mid to late century. So by taking that information on board, we can get a very good idea about what the future of places like the Great Barrier Reef and indeed all these other ecosystems. And it's very important for humans because if you are talking about the loss of coral reefs, for example, you're also talking about a loss of goods and services that come from those ecosystems for humanity. So when you look at the impacts, and these are you know four to five hundred billion dollars per annum uh, of, of lost resources. This is about people, it's about ecosystems, it's about income, it's about food, and it's about livelihoods. And so when one looks at those futures, uh, there are very few options. The first that many people discuss is the idea that corals will evolve. Well, the literature unfortunately doesn't really support rapid evolution of corals. In fact, it probably says it takes a lot longer than many other organisms. Corals have generation times that may be from five to as much as a hundred years before they're at their full reproductive potential. So um, the speed of evolution is inversely proportional to that generation time. 
So it's very unlikely that over the next 30 to 40 years we'll see a sudden you know, burst of, of evolution that will solve the problem and maintain those goods and services I just spoke about. The second thing that a lot of people say is, well, coral reefs will simply migrate to higher latitudes. Now there's some evidence that corals and some uh, organisms such as fish are making it and surviving at higher latitudes. But when you talk about an entire complex ecosystem with as much as a million species involved in it, transferring that to higher latitudes is extremely unlikely. It's also really important to understand that it's not just temperature that restricts corals and coral reefs to the equatorial regions and subtropics. Um, things like light, for example, are really important determinants. And as you go to higher latitudes, the amount of light needed for, by corals starts to diminish and you've got less reef building and, uh, and so on. So those two factors really don't militate that there's an easy out on this one an escape clause, if you like. What we've got to look at is restraining the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions that we currently have. And this is why the Paris Climate Agreement, which, was, uh, which came into force on November 4, a couple of weeks ago, is so important. The goal is to keep um, average surface temperatures of the globe well below two degrees Celsius. Now that's going to cause some impact on corals and in fact we've done modelling studies in the scientific community that suggests we'll still lose 90% of coral and of course the elements of, of, of reef building activities uh, with achieving that target. But what is important there is that we will have the seed stock for the future regrowth of reefs once you have stabilised sea temperature. So really the solution is this, we have to restrict the um, amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere so that we don't overwhelm ecosystems like coral reefs. At the same time, we've got to also take other pressure off these ecosystems to ensure that they have the best chance of surviving the, the coming decades. Because it's that element that's so important. And in that is the sort of intrinsic truth that the only way to deal with the climate problem and the impact and mass coral bleaching becoming more frequent is on the emission side. But the recovery side is equally important. And that's where I think the adaptation approaches of management, um, making sure that fisheries are not to bleating important ecological species and so on is so important. Now, if we can do that, the future is, is bright. It means that we will go through a period when reefs will continue to suffer. But if we can control those emissions and deal with that problem of other factors like pollution and overfishing, we will have coral reefs in the future.